What's going on guys? The Comics Kid 2099 here to talk to you about Ultimate X-Men, Ultimate Fantastic Four, or uh, as it is called on the inside of the book, Ultimate X4. Uh, this is uh, written by Mike Carey, uh, with most of the art by Pascal Ferry, uh, and like four pages uh, by Lionel Francis Yu. Uh, and uh, this is a two-issue miniseries, and if you're thinking this looks a lot bigger than two issues, over half of this uh, trade paperback is official handbook of the Marvel Universe stuff, and I did not bother reading that. I have never cared about handbooks. Uh, I'm here to read a story, not read stats. Uh, so I didn't bother reading any of that. I just read uh, the two issue uh, crossover team up here uh, between the Ultimate X-Men and the Ultimate Fantastic Four. Uh, and this is set, uh, I would say if you're looking at the entire lifespan of the Ultimate Universe, it's in the latter half uh, if you're specifically looking at Ultimate X-Men, which that series uh, ran 100 issues. Uh, it's in the last half of that run, I'm pretty sure. Uh, it's been a very long time since I've read uh, any of Ultimate Fantastic Four or Ultimate X-Men. Uh, specifically with Ultimate X-Men, I have read uh, the Moir run and the Bendis run more recently than I've read anything else that came after Bendis. Uh, once you get past Bendis on Ultimate X-Men, uh, my memories get very fuzzy. Uh, at one point here, Wolverine mentions uh, the Polaris incident that has kind of put a strain in the relationship between uh, Nick Fury and Charles Xavier. Uh, so this takes place some point uh, in that uh, time period. Uh, maybe during or right after the Brian K. Vaughn run of Ultimate X-Men. Uh, and with Ultimate Fantastic Four, this is set sometime after the introduction of the Ultimate version of the Mad Thinker. And I have no idea where that happened. Uh, I don't even remember uh, that happening in Ultimate Fantastic Four. I think that Mike Carey actually wrote some Ultimate Fantastic Four, uh, so this may be bouncing off of some of what he did uh, in that run. Uh, but basically, uh, this is a short, sweet, and to the point. It doesn't really waste any time since it's only two issues. It doesn't have a lot of time to waste. Uh, the Ultimate Mad Thinker, uh, she tricks most of the X-Men into going like on the other side of the planet uh, because uh, she tells them that aliens are, uh, atta are they're mutant aliens who are going to crash land on Earth and they are going to destroy everything they see. Uh, she has like somehow telepathically tricked them into thinking that an alien told them that, so most of the X-Men leave the X-Mansion. Wolverine is not there. Uh, Professor X tells Kitty Pride and Iceman, you stay behind just in case we all die. Someone else needs to warn humanity that this is happening. Uh, and so then uh, Mad Thinker, uh, she goes in the mansion uh, and she steals Cerebro. And then she leaves a trail uh, to trick Wolverine, Kitty Pride, and Iceman into thinking that uh, the Ultimate Fantastic Four were the ones who stole Cerebro. Uh, and so then they go to the Baxter building and they pick a fight with the Fantastic Four. Uh, meanwhile, while that's happening, uh, Mad Thinker, she is somehow using Cerebro to uh, increase her own intelligence. And I'll be honest, I don't really understand how that works. Uh, she says uh, a telepath uh, could use Cerebro uh, to search outward, but you can also use it inward. And that's the only explanation we get. I think it's kind of a weak explanation, but it's fine. This is a short story. We don't have time uh, to get into how she would become even smarter than she already is, uh, but she wants revenge on Reed Richards for something. Uh, I don't remember what uh, and then eventually the Fantastic Four and the X-Men team up uh, and they find a way to defeat her. And I actually like the way that they defeat her. Uh, Reed, uh, it, it's a very interesting way that they find uh, to uh, kind of stop her from doing what she's doing. Uh, it's not just uh, we find the bad guy and then we punch them. Uh, so... Uh, I don't have a whole lot to say about this. Uh, the art, let me go ahead and talk about that because a lot of times I forget to do that. Uh, I really like Pascal Ferry's art. Uh, it's very unique. I can't think of any artist that is similar uh, to uh, Ferry's style. I am not a big fan of Lionel Francis Yu's art style. I never have been. Uh, I never like it whenever you have a story, whether it's two issues long or six issues long, uh, and then let's say four issues of a story is drawn by John Smith, and then two issues are drawn by uh, Jacob Jones. Uh, I never like that. Uh, if I'm reading something month to month, which I don't do anymore, but back when I was, it didn't bother me as much because I'm reading an issue now, and then a month from now I'm reading a different issue and I can't expect John Smith to stay on this comic forever uh, so obviously at some point there's going to be a different artist come in 
But when I'm reading a book, I'm looking at the whole thing as one story, and I want the one story to be drawn by one artist. Uh, and if it's a longer story, uh, if it's something huge, uh, then I'm a little more forgiving. Uh, but in that case, I want you to get uh, other artists who kind of have similar styles that work well together. Uh, and it's difficult because Pascal Ferry uh, has a... Uh, it doesn't look painted, but it looks very unique. It's hard for me to describe uh, Pascal Ferry's art. I can't think of anyone else who has a style similar to that. It's definitely not Lionel Francis Yu. Uh, and part of this is I'm just not a fan of Yu's artwork, uh, but also Yu's art does not look anything like Pascal Ferry's art. And so it's really weird that in a two-issue miniseries that somehow Pascal Ferry was not able to do all the art. Uh, I wish they could have just gotten an artist who could do both issues, all of it, uh, or uh, get Pascal Ferry to do one issue and then get somebody else to do issue two. But what they did... Pascal Ferry does all of issue one, and then most of issue two, uh, there's a few pages that Lionel Francis Yu does, and I don't get it. Uh, I don't understand why they couldn't have just waited until Pascal Ferry finished uh, the issue, and then they could have just had the whole thing be by Pascal Ferry. And that's easier for me to say when I'm reading it much later after the issue was uh, released. But somebody who is buying uh, these issues as they're coming out, maybe there was already a delay, and maybe these guys are looking at their watches like, okay, I'm ready for issue two, where is it? And maybe editorial said, let's just get Lionel Francis Yu to pinch four pages. Uh, it's really, really odd to me that they didn't get uh, Pascal Ferry to do all the art or uh, get someone else to do all of the art, someone who can do two issues. Uh, it'd be one thing if it was a 12-issue series like Crisis on Infinite Earths or something, and someone said, you know, I thought I could do 12 issues, uh, but that's a whole lot and I'm not going to be able to do it. I'd be a little forgiving, but two issues, I, I don't really understand uh, what's happening there. Uh, I will say, reading this in isolation, uh, many years after I read uh, all of uh, Ultimate Fantastic Four, uh, I will say uh, the motivations of the bad guy kind of fall flat for me. I really have no idea why the Mad Thinker has uh, this uh, hard-on of revenge against uh, Reed Richards. Uh, I don't know what's going on there, uh, and I feel like the X-Men side of things uh, kind of stands on a its own a little bit more. It's been as long, if not longer, uh, since I've read uh, the Ultimate X-Men stuff. Uh, like I said, I've read Miller through Bendis, and then uh, all the other stuff in that Ultimate X-Men run, I read when it was coming out. So it's been a very long time uh, since I've read any of that Ultimate X-Men stuff. But I feel like since Polar that thing with Polaris that Wolverine mentions doesn't really have anything to do with this story, uh, I feel like that's fine. But since The Mad Thinker, this is building... I'm I'm assuming it's building off of something that happened in the Ultimate Fantastic Four run. I think this should have just been collected in a Ultimate Fantastic Four trade paperback. Uh, this should have just been uh, in whatever volume uh, introduces the Ultimate Mad Thinker. Uh, they did that in the Malar Ultimate X-Men run. Uh, there was a four-issue miniseries called Ultimate War, uh, where the X-Men were on the run, they were being branded as terrorists, and the Ultimates are trying to find them and fight them. Uh, and they collected that uh, as a volume of Ultimate X-Men. They didn't call it Ultimate War, they called it Ultimate X-Men Volume 4 or whatever. Uh, and I wish they had just done that with this and just said this is part of the Ultimate Fantastic Four run and the X-Men are guest starring. Uh, and then I think it would have read a little bit better if I had just read what introduced uh, the Ultimate Mad Thinker uh, into Ultimate Fantastic Four. As is, uh, I think this is a fun issue, or a fun little story. Uh, it's got some great moments in it. Uh, Johnny and uh, the Human Torch, uh, they're very similar characters. Uh, I'm sorry, it's been a long day. Johnny, the Human Torch, and Iceman, uh, they kind of have this buddy rivalry, a lot like what they have in the comics. It works. They're very similar characters. Uh, you've got uh, the uh, the reason for the fight, uh, I think, is it works well. Uh, the bad guy is manipulating these two groups who have never met each other into fighting. Uh, the X-Men have a good reason for thinking the Fantastic Four uh, stole this stuff from them, the Fantastic Four. At one point, Sue calls them terrorists, and uh, that makes sense based on uh, their history back uh, during the Malar run, where they were branded as terrorists. Uh, Kitty Pride is basically drooling all over Reed Richards' lap, uh, and she seems to really be eating up his science-y uh, gobbledygook, um, which is kind of strange because 
I it's been a while, but I don't recall Kitty Pride in the Ultimate Universe being uh, as much of a computer geek as she was in the main Marvel Universe. Uh, but here, she really likes Reed uh, talking about the science stuff, and then uh, Johnny is complaining like, "Well, I'm right here. Why isn't she talking to me?" And Sue uh, says like, uh, "She she dresses cheap and she's a terrorist." And uh, that's great. I love that Sue doesn't like Kitty, even when they're teaming up. She doesn't like Kitty. Uh, I think that's amazing. I wish we had more team ups between the Fantastic Four and the X Men so we could have more of Sue trash talking Kitty Pride. That would have been great. Uh, I I like this. Uh, I do wish that we had more consistent art all the way through. Uh, I wish it could have been a little bit longer, but I don't think they would have been able to have stretched uh, this story much longer than what they did. Uh, and I, like I said, I wish that the presentation here, instead of by itself in its own book, I wish they had put it in one of the Ultimate Fantastic Four books. Uh, so that's all that I have to say about Ultimate X4. Uh, I hope you guys like this review, and I will be back in the future to talk about something else. In the meantime, have a great rest of your day. Catch you later.